All right, hello there, fellow uh, music geeks. Um, today we're going to touch on something kind of cool. Um, and although this is on, on the uh, pentatonic playlist, this uh, technique or this idea can be used for uh, diatonic scales, arpeggios, uh, even certain uh, licks that are at least are completely ascending or descending licks. Uh, you can use this concept. And what is the concept? Uh, this is called sequences, okay? And as, believe it or not, as a lot of, uh, a lot of the things I teach, sometimes um, the ideas came from uh, overhearing a conversation between two students at music school when I was uh, attending. Um, and uh, this idea called sequences was generated, uh, at least I expanded on it because I heard uh, two guys talking about uh, the jazz pianist McCoy Tyner and how he was using sequences on pentatonic scales to get a particular type of sound. Again, uh, sequences do not uh, need to be used just solely with pentatonic scales. They could be used in arpeggios and diatonic scales as well. Uh, but they kind of sound especially cool with pentatonics for some reason. All right, so um, what exactly is a sequence? A sequence is a very basic and simple mathematical algorithm. Now, I know right away that sounds like, uh-oh, right? But really, this is basically, this is a simple thing. For example, if I said to you, one, two, three, two, three, four, three, four, five. Could you continue the pattern? Yeah, four, five, six, five, six, seven, six, seven, eight. That's what a sequence is. Uh, now, what a sequence actually, the effect of a sequence is that it uh, has a sense of building up to a point. So what you want to do, and I'm going to demonstrate uh, in a few moments later on, uh, what you want to do with the sequence is once you do that building up, you want to tie a ribbon or a bow at the end of it, meaning you do your sequence and then create a kind of um, resolving phrase. Because sequences have the tendency to build up a lot of rhythmic tension. What they are really is motifs. They're, they're um, a kind of repeating motif. So uh, I guess to get started, let's just get started. So let's say I have the number sequence one, two. We're going to do a two note, uh, well, a two, uh, a, uh, a two, it's not two notes because it's the entire scale, but it's, we're going to do a one, two sequence. In other words, two numbers. All right, so if I take my basic pentatonic scale, first of all, what I want to do is assign a number to every step of the scale. Now, these numbers have nothing to do with uh, harmony or music theory, like, you know, the five, seven or any of that stuff. This is just simply the sequences of numbers in order of the scale. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, 10, 11, 12, using our basic primary pentatonic scale. Uh, I guarantee you, if you start doing this in the other shapes, uh, you'll some of them will become harder and some will become easier depending on the shape. And you'll see why pretty soon. All right, so a one, two sequence. What is that? So we want to do one, two, two, three, three, four. Now, um, you'll hear when I demonstrate, this is a great double picking exercise. In other words, to get that kind of sound where you're double picking each note. So if I go up the pentatonic scale, I go one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, five, six, six, seven, I get this. Now, to hear how that sequence would sound in the context, here's some music. And again, you see it that I, I wound up uh, tying up the phrase by going. Think of it this way. The sequence is leading you somewhere. So you're going to Bob's house to a party. The sequence is taking you to the door. All right. Uh, I'd say at the moment you stop on the door, stop at the door and knock or ring the doorbell. That's when you tie up the entire phrase. Now you're at Bob's doorstep. When you went to the party, that's a whole new story. So that's a whole new set of phrases. Okay. Uh, so anyway, that was a one, two, but what about reversing it? What about two, one? So if I said two, one, three, two, four, three, five, four, I'd get this. Two, one, three, two, four, 
four, three, five, four, so I get. Now one, a very important point about this, sequences reverse themselves when you're descending down, back down the scale. So in other words, I'm going backwards, two to one, three to two. Now, when I finally reach the top, I have to do the reverse. I have to go up rather than down. I was going two, one. Now I have to go 11, 12 back up. So I get. So again. And in a musical context. So that's the one, two sequence. Now, uh, this sequence is based on uh, uh, two note phrases repeating themselves. But what if I went instead of one, two or two, one, what if I went from one to three? So that would be the third step up. Here's my first step, second step, third step. So one, three, two, four, three, five, four, six. Okay. And I get something like this. So uh, let's hear that in a musical context. Okay. So I hope this is making some sense. It's really not daunting mathematics at all. In fact, it's a lot e easier than a lot of music theory is. All right. So uh, we covered now. I'll tell you this, like, first of all, it's a real, like I mentioned a moment ago, it's really important that you reverse the sequence when you reach the top. So if I was doing a three, two, one sequence, when I get to the top, instead of going down three, two, one, I'd go up 10, 11, 12, and then nine, 10, 11, and so on and so forth. Um, now, what I want to encourage is that if you think about it, the, the possibilities of sequences are infinite, all right? You can make up literally hundreds and thousands of these things. What I would recommend and really strongly recommend is that when you work with a sequence, uh, say you work with a bunch of the ones I show you today, just choose the ones that you like, okay? In other words, and there are two criteria for, for liking. One is it sounds good to you, that's the most important. And secondly, it feels good to play. It's not, it's not overwhelming to play. But I guarantee you, uh, when we get to the one, two, three sequence, you'll actually physically see it. But there's a moment that comes when you practice these things because they are a number sequence. And because you're only using two fingers per string on the scale, you're going to notice that um, the, your hand remembers the pattern pretty easily. It's kind of cool. It's a kinesthetic thing. Your hand just starts to remember it. You start repeating these things over and over again within a few minutes, you'll start to, it'll just kind of fall into place and groove on its own. Um, now, the reason I say choose and pick your own, uh, this is what I do because look, when I'm about to execute, uh, execute a lick in a public setting, I want to feel confident of myself. I don't want to, you know, do something that I might, you know, screw up. So I want to pick and choose the things that I like the best and I feel the best about and uh, use that as part of my, um, bag of licks. I always have this image like you're holding this big old like sack like Santa's bag, right? And you you learn a lick and you throw it in that bag and you throw it in that bag and you throw it in that bag. And when it comes time to play the licks, you pick and choose. Actually, you know, a um, little side note story. I have a buddy who was uh, Bob Dylan's session acoustic guitar player, and he was also uh, buddies with Bob. And when they would walk around Manhattan in the 60s, he noticed that Bob had a little notebook. And whenever he heard a really cool turn of a phrase, he would write the phrase down in his notebook. And, uh, you know, he'd go through the course of the day, and every once in a while, my friend Bruce would see him write something. And then finally, when Bob got home, he would rip out all the pages that he wrote down the phrases on, throw them in a basket. And then when he was in the mood to write a song, he'd start picking out these little phrases and saying, oh, how can I make this fit into my song? It's a great way to work. Same thing with licks. You have a bag over here, and you keep throwing those licks in. And what that bag is, is basically your memory, your unconscious uh, stowed memories of what to play. 
Okay, so now let's move on to uh, three note sequences. Uh, oh, by the way, that one I just showed you, one, three, two, four. On my first CD, Luke de Jure, I have a... I have a song called Hannah's Lullaby that I wrote for my daughter. And one of the, the filler licks after... That was from one of those sequences. I use sequences a lot. They're awesome. All right. So anyway, let's get on to the one, two, three, the three note sequences. <clears throat> so uh, we'll just do basic one, two, three. Oh, by the way, uh, you know, side note, now that we're on three note sequences, uh, one of the ways I got this idea was from uh, Jimmy Page, because uh, on one of the, I think on the first record, he did a lick, maybe on the, uh, I forget what song it was, maybe... Good Times, Bad Times, or Communication Breakdown, where he does this lick. Um, and uh, it was also in that lick, that same lick was in a pop song in the 60s that had nothing to do with Led Zeppelin. Uh, but anyway, I like the sound of that. So that that's kind of perked my ears up to it. And eventually, when I went to college, I finally put the pieces together and came up with this idea of sequences. All right, so uh, the one, two, three sequence. All right, so one, two, three, two, three, four, three, four, five, four, five, six. Now I could do it in a triplet setting. Here's some music. All right, and that would make sense because it's a three note sequence, but what I like to do is pit two against three. So instead of uh, doing triplets, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, I'll do the three note sequence in pairs of eighth notes. It has a different sound when you, when you change the uh, rhythmic structure of it at the bottom. All right, so that was one, two, three. Now we're getting into heavier territory, We'll try three, two, one. Three, two, one. Four, three, two. Five, four, three. Six, five, four. And notice again, I'm going down. Three, two, one. But when I start the descent, I go 10, 11, 12, uh, 9, 10, 11, 8, 9, 10. in a context. All right, as you can hear, when you keep repeating like that, it creates this kind of a snowballing tension effect. But you want to create release. Music is about tension and release, yin and yang. That's all it's about. So, um, if you create some tension, you want the listener to finally relax. If all you create is tension, as in atonal dissonant music, the listener gets no rest whatsoever. Um, all right, so now we heard that as... Um, that's not triplets. That's one, two, 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 three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, like that. But if I treat it as a triplet, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, in another context. Again, it, uh, it builds up and uh, has a different feel with the, um, with the uh, triplet sound. All right, so we did threes. Now, uh, those are the the sets of three that I do, but you know, you could do something like, instead of uh, one, two, three, you could do maybe one, two, four. I can't, I don't want to figure that out now, but literally you could, there's, the, the possibilities are endless. Um, Let's go back to the one, two, for example, for endless possibilities. I did one, three. Well, what about one, four? Then I'd get, oh, sorry. Like that, all right? And that could be in 
futuristic sound. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, practice in front of you to get this down. Again, uh, there are some I could toss right off and some I'd have to actually work on doing. Why? Because I have ones that I, I particularly cherish and enjoy. And, uh, you know, if I get bored and want something new, I could start working on a new and different sequence. That might sound good. Okay, so that was the uh, threes. Let's look at the fours now. So we have one, two, three, four. This is the one McCoy Tyner was known for, especially descending. All right, so we got one, two, three, four, two, three, four, five. Once again, I can't stress this enough. When you go backwards, you have to reverse the sequence. So four, three, two, one here, but 10, 11, uh, 9, 10, 11, 12 there. Up, down, right? This is down, this is up. Okay? So now the one, two, three, four in context of music. you don't want to do the sequence all damn day you want to build up to a phrase i'm extending them out for your sake so you can hear the wider context but of course you want to you don't want to keep them that going that long okay so that was a one two three four now uh this is going to set you up for a little bit of a disclaimer that um, when you're dealing especially in pentatonic scales which have larger leaps inside of them uh some of these sequences if you make up your own all right, with any big leaps, you might run into a part problem. And let me explain why. Now I'm going to do the four, three, two, one sequence, and I'm going to come a little closer so you can see my fingers. Four, three, two, one, right? Then, then I have to jump from here to here. So I get. The problem isn't there because jumping from there to there is easy. It's just a matter of almost making a bar. And then when you get that note, you can release it and get ready for the next one. However, backwards. See that? I have to jump now to my G string with the first finger. Well, that's clunky and not graceful. Now, the reason I'm close up is because what I did to remedy this problem was I switched out my middle finger from my first finger whenever it landed at here at the fifth fret. So I get. Uh, uh. Well, let me do that again. So I can start with my first finger here because there's no, it's not going to jump yet. Okay, so now that's the one, two, three, four backwards, four, three, two, one, and um, I don't know how rusty I am on this one, but we'll do uh, we'll do that in a musical context. As you can see, these things sound really cool. Um, all right, so that was the four. Now, you can do a sequence for as many numbers as you like. Go up to seven or eight if you'd like to. The furthest I go is six, all right? And uh, I'm going to show you when I get to six how you, could, uh, how you could modify these things. And by the way, Audrey Hepburn says hello. Hi, Audrey. She's my uh, eternal lover for life. All right, anyway, uh, so let's do one, two, three, four, five, all right? Now, this is where it gets cool, because whether, whether you're in a triplet or a duplet situation, whether you're doing triplets or straight eighth notes, you're going to go out of phase because we have sets of five against three or two, uh, where it really sounds cool and complex is three against five. But let's just do eighth notes. So we got one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. I can't count and do it. You can hear how it sets a five. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. But when you have straight time in four, this is going to react against it and create oodles more tension in your sequence. Where it really 
really sounds cool is in a triplet setting. So here's a, a faster piece I can. So now I get triplets. I like the descending one. Oh. And that, that, um, would have been great for the 70s style jazz fusion, like Return to Forever kind of stuff, those kind of sequences. And in fact, people like uh, Chick Corea and Al Demiola were using sequences, but not as cool as the three against five. That, that's mine. And you can have it. All right. So now um, we talked about. All right. Let's look at six. We haven't looked at six yet. So let's do that. Six, I don't have rehearsed in the precise way, I have it rehearsed a different way and I'll show you both. All right, so if I go one, two, three, four, five, six, I have to go two, three, four, five, six, seven. because I have the same problem as a reverse force because I have to use my middle finger to adapt where my first finger would have been. So a one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, Actually, no, I could I could do a crossover that one. There's this one. Yeah, that's going up is where it's a problem. Wow, this is a hard one, so I'm going to have to practice it. The way I do sixes is instead of going one, two, three, four, five, six, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I go one, two, three, four, five, six, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So what I'm doing is I'm doing a chunk of six notes, then starting on the A string and doing a chunk of six notes, then starting on the D string. All right, so that's kind of cheating because I'm skipping one of the numbers. Uh, the uh, let's say I'm skipping the even numbers two, four, six, and eight. So I'm going, I'm starting on one, three, uh, five, seven, and the same in reverse. So let's hear the sixes in context. Uh, one second, something screwed up here. All right, so that's uh, sixes. Now, uh, hmm. I mean, I could venture to do the sixes backwards. Uh, That would, but I'm nowhere near rehearsed for that one. So if you want to work that out, be my guest. All right. Now, so there was one point I brought up a moment ago that you could pit rhythm against rhythm. So say uh, uh, you could do the five step sequence in a triplet form. And once again, I'll demonstrate that one. Descending. And again, you always want to wrap your sequence up in a, a nice little melodic uh, phrase at the end. I call it tying a bow around the phrase. All right. So uh, now we're talking again. I made the point that you could do a uh, five but uh keep it against th uh the three the triplet rhythm and so you get this really complex sounding sequence but what i haven't talked about another thing you could do is work with let's say for example if i put the blue note into my uh pentatonic scale <laughs> and they call this a blue scale to me that's bs it's a pentatonic scale with a passing tone it's not a scale per se, not the way 
uh, nature kind of handed it over to us. All right, in any case, um, what I'm going to do is I'm not just going to add this blue note, which is an E flat and two and two different octaves when I go through the scale. E flat, E flat, E flat, E flat. But I'm also going to add a G sharp, so I'm going to fill in the flat seven to the natural seven to the root, so I get... It's perfectly fine to do that. A chromatic passing tone is not a bad thing. So now what happens if I apply a sequence to this? All right. Well, here's a one, two, three, four sequence. And now the numbers change because before I had one, two, three, four. But now with the blue note, the blue note becomes four and the next note up becomes five, the E. So I uh, have a different set of numbers. And I'm going to do a four note sequence with these two extra notes in my scale. Sorry. All right. All right, that sounds really cool. So in a context... Context of a, a triplet. All right, you can see how complicated that sounds, but if you understand that that's all you're doing, you could fool the listener into thinking you're doing something incredibly sophisticated when in fact it's just a simple number pattern. Okay, so. Um, uh, I'm giving you the example of a uh, an altered uh, pentatonic scale. What about diatonic scales? All right, the the effect will be very different in a diatonic scale than a pentatonic scale. All right. So, for example, um, if I do one, three, two, four. And pentatonic, what that amounts to in a diatonic scale is all right. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, sorry. This is supposed to right. It goes backwards. All right. So, uh, I think that was supposed to be Aeolian, so. That's a hard one. I haven't practiced these with diatonics in a very long time. So uh, I'm good with the, the basic major shape. So and actually, when I was uh, trying to get through that last one, you notice I slowed it down and I created rhythmic breaks. Yeah, you can do that, too. So look, be creative. Don't just take this material and repeat it. Take it apart and see what you could do with it. That will change it completely from what I'm doing. Because quite honestly, one of my searches as a guitar player was to do licks that no other guitar player, I've never heard another guitar player do. And that includes this one. I don't believe I've heard anybody do that except for me, which is great because the point is you want to leave your signature. You might not be the fastest guitar player that ever lived. You might not be the most, uh, you know, uh, jazz like jump through hip hoops guitar player but if you create licks that are all your own you will have your signature just the way picasso had his signature and it, you didn't even need the signature because you look at a picasso and you know it's a picasso you know so you want to develop your own sound if you learn other people's licks 
uh, uh, you know, tweak them. I'll give you an example. Like Joe Pass used to do this against a major chord. So what I did was I strung all the breaths together. In other words, a straight string of eighth notes. And I thought, oh, that's slightly different than Joe Pass. But then I thought, well, he never did it with a minor chord. So now I have a new lick that I haven't heard any other jazz guitarists do. Okay, so uh, that's what I'm talking about. Stretch ideas. Don't just take the idea and use it. Be creative with it. Go nuts with it. Now, one more example is um, well, we did diatonic scales. But now let's look at arpeggios, all right? Uh, I like the ninth arpeggio. All right. So now I'm going to do, a, let's see, a one, two, three, four sequence with the ninth. Okay, so that. Um, you know, uh, uh, let's see if I could do this in a context. Now, what I'm about to do is a C major 7 arpeggio against this A minor situation. Uh, what that does is it turns the A minor into A minor 9. Actually, I'm doing a C major 9 at this point, so I might as well go the whole hog. One more time. All right, so you can see you can get all sorts of effects from these. You can use them on arpeggios, pentatonic scales, and diatonic scales. And, and in the next lesson, I'm going to be showing you all about artificial pentatonics, which are really cool. And then you could use these on artificial pentatonics. Uh, just a quick example of an artificial pentatonic is if I flat the five in a pentatonic scale, which is the blue note, but don't leave the original five in there. So instead of going, I'm going. So I could do a one, two, three, four. Uh, like that, all right? So the possibilities, it really gets cool, okay, is what I'm trying to say. So that's it for today for sequences. I hope you all enjoyed this, and uh, I'll be seeing you soon. Take care.